Well, I want to thank Victoria and I want to thank Mike for asking me to come and do this presentation. Um, we're going to talk, I, I refer to it as a sustainability journey. Companies don't sit here one day and say, tomorrow I'm going to be fully sustainable. And it doesn't happen that fast and it doesn't happen that black and white. It's a journey, it's a process. People have to learn and figure out what to do and how to do. There's no book out there that tells you how to get from here to there. And every company has to do a very different thing. No two companies are the same. They're in different locations, they have different issues, um, different things that they work on, and so it's a, it is a journey. Um, but it's not gonna be just about Sensata. Sensata is just a microcosm of thousands of industries around the world that are doing the same thing. And so I'm gonna talk both about some of the things that Sensata has been doing, but also about how other companies as well might be doing some things. So to give you a little bit of background of me, I apologize I don't have my name up there, it's Rich Donito. Um, I've been in the environmental health and safety business for over 35 years. It's actually even longer, I don't want to mention how long. Um, I've, uh, I've been involved with um, uh, tracking regulatory information around the world in 100 different countries, um, that just to keep on informed about what com com countries are regulating uh, companies to do. We have to keep in involved with that process. I've, uh, I work all over the world. I just got back from Okinawa, Japan, um, Korea, Guam, Kuwait, uh, a variety of other countries. I'm traveling all the time, going to different you know, factories around the world, seeing how things are being operated, how things are being done, work with people to improve the process. I've conducted over 400 audits for ISO. It's the International Standards Organization for Health and Safety and for Environmental, get, getting facilities up to speed with the best um, systems in place to manage their ongoing activities. Um, I've actually done environmental remediation, cleaned up hazardous waste sites um, around the world, working on sites in uh, Brazil and central US. And one of the important things, we'll talk about this um, aspect as, as a part of the sort of the journey, due diligence. When people buy companies and buy other facilities, you wanna make sure, are they dirty, are they clean? And so you do due diligence, and we've done over $5 billion worth of due diligence for global acquisitions and mergers. So these are the kinds of um, companies that I've worked with over the years and my colleagues have worked with. You'll see a lot of similar names in there. Amazon, um, Westinghouse, Colgate, General Mills, Verizon, General Electric. These are the companies um, that I've worked with over the last 35 plus years. So a lot of familiar names and uh, we, we continue to work with all of them. So when we talk about sustainability, there's a lot of terms that come up, a lot of acronyms. There's, it's a world of acronyms and sometimes we'll be in meetings and discussions and an outsider may say, what are you guys talking about? I haven't heard a single word. EMPs, Mike talked about the environmental master plan, that's important for Attleboro, but sustainability, ESG, What's ESG? In corporate Social Responsibility, EHS, Environmental Stewardship, CDP, GHG, you know, it just goes on and on and on. When you get used to them, we can just talk in acronyms and we all know what we're doing. So we'll, we'll hopefully demystify some of this um, tonight and certainly ask questions at any point. So the first thing I want to talk about are that what are the drivers for sustainability? Why would you do it? Why would you even think about sustainability? What drives people to do sustainability? And that really is the case with anything. Why does anybody do anything? What causes you to go from this point to that point? There's always a driver. And so we'll talk about what some of the drivers are for sustainability. That too, the drivers have changed over time. So if we <clears throat> look at industry worldwide in the US prior to 1970, um, I use 1970s as a break point. Um, and we'll discuss why that is uh, in a minute. But prior to 1970s, this was your, the state of industry. Um, they produced air emissions with little or no controls, um, created a lot of hazardous waste site, a lot of waste of different types that would just kind of go out there somewhere. Um, wastewater discharges, most industries used a lot of water, used a lot of chemicals into the sewer systems. And sometimes it would go into groundwater and in surface water. At the same time, use a lot of energy and use a lot of raw materials to make parts, make components, cars, you know, um, airplanes, refrigerators, chairs, whatever. Um, takes a lot of materials. So there's a lot going on here. 
but a lot of it wasn't controlled. It was just done, nobody cared. It was just the way things were. And as a result, we have these kinds of conditions that were created. So a lot of companies would discharge their chemicals into rivers. Years ago, we did a study of a factory in China. Couldn't go over there, so we had them video. We did live video stream. And we said, well, so where's all the industrial wastewater go? And they kind of went out and it was in pipes out into a lagoon that was an estuary tied to the ocean. And I go, so raw chemicals are just going into the lagoon. So I noticed across the lagoon, there were all these grates with huts. What's going on there? Well, that's all the chicken farms. And why are there grates? Well, the stuff goes into the lagoon. Why are all the people fishing around the lagoon? Well, this is a major shrimp farm to package shrimp to go to the United States. So <clears throat> that's the state of industry prior to the 1970s. This is the kinds of things that were going on. Mike talked about some of the history we had in forming an environmental organization when we were in high school. This isn't a photograph of what we discovered, but this is an example. We found thousands of drums of arsenic trioxide just disposed in the back 40 um, in land. Um, but a lot of companies would just have these sort of chemicals piled up in a very messy situation. So that was pre-1970s. So what happened? Well, again, there were no drivers in the pre-70s. There were no penalties. There were no concerns. People weren't getting sick. It hadn't happened yet. Things hadn't taken the time to sort of have that impact. However, in the 70s, you have EPA. EPA was finally formed. A lot of regulations came into place. And it started with the EPA, and it started slowly filtering out into other countries as well. Um, <clears throat> so we had air, water, and waste regulations being put in place. Now companies had a driver. We have to comply with these regulations. And so all of those sort of bad things we just saw were now starting to be controlled. Stack emissions had to be controlled. Waste couldn't just be discharged anywhere. The controls on, on wastewater discharge, control on how hazardous waste would be disposed of. So those regulations became a driver for industry. In the 1980s, we had civil suits. Think of Love Canal, Woburn. Mike and I have a history in Woburn. Um, the Erin Brockovich case in California. Those kinds of things forced industry to take yet another look at how they were going to deal with the situation. If it wasn't the regulations, now we have people getting sick and suing us. We had communities suing us. We had all kinds of civil suits coming up. That became a new driver. Then by the 1980s and the 1990s, lenders said, wait a minute, we're not giving you money to expand your plant or to buy another company, because if you buy something that is contaminated, you're gonna lose all the profit in cleaning that mess up. So all of a sudden due diligence, and I talked about all the due diligence I've been involved with, has stemmed from this initial push with lenders. So it's very hard to buy anything anymore without doing some form of due diligence to make sure that what you're buying is well managed, is clean, um, is in good shape. And so a lot of due diligence became the driver in the 90s. In the early 2000s, corporate social responsibility became a big issue. Consumers started weighing in. Um, when the Exxon Valdez um, oil spill occurred in Alaska, thousands upon thousands of people called Exxon and said, I'm not buying your gas anymore. I'm cutting up my card and I'm going away from you. So people became a driver. They used their wallet, their pocketbook to force companies to do things. Um, when certain foods were contaminated with lead and pet foods and various things like that, that became a consumer-driven um, forcing issue for companies to make change. And so that became a new driver. In the 2010s, investors started weighing in. I'm not going to invest my money in your company if you've got a bad track record. And you go into any trading area. You go into BlackRock, um, Fidelity, and you go into the, the screens. The first thing you will see is the ESG score for every company. And people will sit there and score, your score is no good. I'm not putting money into you. 
And so that became a big driver. Um, people wanted to see you submit to CDP. CDP is the uh, Carbon Disclosure Project. And so you would fill out all these forms and put in information as to how much greenhouse gases you were emitting. And a score would come out, and that would get published publicly. And now your name is global, and companies could look you up and say, ooh, CDP, your, your score is a D. Uh-uh, I'm not, I'm not investing in you. And so those became some new drivers. Industry groups, I can't tell you how many massive surveys we would fill out, still fill out, hundreds every year of companies to sit there and say, okay, we're gonna buy your product, we need you to fill this out. You need to tell us how many incidents you had last year, how much greenhouse gas emissions you had last year, how much energy did you consume, uh, how many kilograms of waste did you generate. You have to fill out all this information and that becomes a mechanism to support your operation in order to get business from customers. So that became a driver. Today, it is a multifaceted set of drivers. There's no one issue anymore. It's a whole cavalcade of issues that you have to manage to. And it's about employees. Sensata and a lot of companies, employees come in, they go, you don't have a sustainability report. I'm not working here. And so those become drivers. Um, people want to see recycling bins in offices, you know, various things like that force companies to do things. So it's a very multifaceted situation today. Companies face a whole cavalcade of issues to manage to, and we put this all under the umbrella of sustainability. Each company has to decide which issues are most important to them. It's called materiality analysis, and that helps you identify where you're going to look. There are hundreds of different things a company can look at to, Im to improve its performance when you're talking about sustainability. So let me just step back for a minute to tell you a little bit about Sensata, where it's been and where it has gone and where it is today because it has changed. So um, today Sensata makes lots of components, $4 billion a year revenue, uh, over 19,000 employees in 15 countries. We have about 125 actual individual properties around the world. Um, and I visit a lot of those and work with people. Last night I was talking with folks in Japan, working on some chemical management issues with them. Um, so we're constantly working with all of these people in all of these countries. And it's a 24-hour, it's a seven-day-a-week job. So from a Sensata perspective, this is a timeline of the history of the Attleboro operation. Uh, I know it's perhaps a little hard to see, but it was started in 1916. That's when, I wouldn't call it Sensata, it was a different company name at that point. Um, it was called General Plate. Then in uh, 1959, Texas Instruments became part of Texas Instruments. It's a name I think a lot of people are familiar with. And then in 2006, Texas Instruments sold off its whole worldwide manufacturing operations. And that's when Sensata was born. Um, they acquired Sensata, basically all of the, um, a lot of the manufacturing, what's called sensors and controls, became Sensata on a worldwide basis. And heavy uh, product manufacturing, um, but today we're moving into the electrification universe um, because that's where the future is, is going. But just to give you a little bit of what does Sensata mean, it comes from the Latin word sensate, meaning sense, gifted, those gifted with sense. Um, I'll also mention that this little colored dotting system down here, that is Braille for Sensata. Purpose, basically, we want to deliver a cleaner, more efficient, electrified, and connected world. That's the mission, and so the product designs, and the products that are being developed today are trying to focus on these words in this direction. Make over a billion individual parts every year, lots of products and brands but they're small. These things are barely the size of my hand. Over a billion of these things. And just to give you some sense, every single car in the world has not less than 50 Sensata components in it, up to about 150 components. You can't find a car in the world that doesn't have a lot of Sensata components to it. When you go put air in your tire, that valve stem, that's from Sensata. When you sit in your seat, there's a sensor measuring how much you weigh to tell the airbag 
What kind of person is there? That's from Sensata. There are lots of different components. When we get into airplanes, over 1,500 components to an airplane are made by Sensata. Every airplane, commercial airplane in the world. So when Sully Sullenberger landed the plane on the Hudson River over in Attleboro, we have a giant photo of the plane on the river with all the people standing on the wings. Sully Sullenberger wrote his signature across the thing and gave it to us because it was our parts that gave him the ability to land the plane. He was able to measure and sense what was going on and the different components of that plane that allowed him to land it and land it safely. We have letters from pilots all over the world because all the ejector buttons on fighter jets, that whole system is made by Sensata. And fighter jets make it out because those devices work. We used to say we, may, we, we are mission critical. Our parts are very oriented towards living and dying, planes and automobiles. They sense and make sure parts have to be 100% perfect and have to work all the time. So it's very important. And it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of design and a lot of people to make those parts work. But today, the world is changing. Cars are moving from combustion to electric, and that's happening very rapidly. Can't make enough parts now just to get those electric cars made. And Sensata makes important devices now for almost all the electric cars in the world. Uh, we also make a lot of components for freight trucks and various other devices, um, all electrically based uh, because everybody's moving into that electric universe. Uh, a lot of components everywhere are going electric. And so we're designing similar size parts for that process. A lot of sensing devices for logistics, um, medical devices, um, you know, a lot of battery power systems require sensing devices to make sure they operate properly and don't overcharge. So those overcharging sensing devices are basically designed and made by Sensata. So that just gives you a backdrop of Sensata's history and going from sort of combustion to now electric. So going with where the universe is going. So let's talk about Sensata's journey on the sustainability front. And it's the same for a lot of other companies. Three stages in the early 2000s, it was about safety, regulatory compliance. Um, in the beginning of tracking of what we call KPIs, key performance indicators, um, we wanted to know how we were doing. So we track workplace incidents. How much waste did we generate? And how much energy do we use? Because those were important. We knew those were going to be important. We weren't quite sure how we were going to use that information, but I think there's an expression, you manage what you measure. And if you start measuring, all of a sudden you go, oh, wow, we're using a lot. We're creating a lot. What can we do to improve? In the 2010s, we started getting into ESG and related reporting because the investors, the customers were pushing us to report on what we were doing. And then today, we have a full-fledged sustainability program. And again, that's the journey. I'll talk about a few of these types of items that we've implemented. So one of the first things we did was we got certified under what's called ISO 14001. It is the environmental management standard. It basically says you have an envi a proper environmental management program where you're managing both your energy usage as well as your waste generation to reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, massive documents of plans, lots of tracking, looking at every type of place where we might have an environmental issue. When we look at it through a life cycle, what's coming in, what are we using here and creating here, and what's going out the door. So it's a whole process. Massive tracking sheets, spreadsheets like you can't believe, thousands of data points. Um, one of my colleagues, she just finished doing the greenhouse gas calculations uh, for Sensata globally. We went through 7,000 invoices and tabulated more than 35,000 individual data points to compile how much greenhouse gas emissions were occurring. It's a massive, massive effort. Um, and we're down to, okay, you have a grill that you're doing a barbecue on a couple times a year. How much propane are you using? And we literally are tracking down to that level. Um, every vehicle, everywhere in the world gets tracked. We have to get, everybody has to keep track of all of their gas purchases. We even track how many people drive by bus, um, by motorcycle, vehicles, electric vehicles. 
It's like how many people come in by bike, how many miles, we track everything. And so that helps us um, understand what's going on and where we can further reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we track over time electricity use, look at plots and see what's going on. Is the trend changing? Is it improving? Uh, where do we have differences? Um, when we get into the ESG reporting, ESG stands for Environment, Social and Governance. It's not just environmental, it's not just energy improvement. It's a whole host of issues. Social is two things. Um, the social as aspects of your organization, such as diversity and equity, uh, equal pay, those kinds of things, but it's also safety, a lot of safety issues. People want safe work environments. Uh, and then governance is transparency. There's a whole issue around governance and uh, corporate governance and making sure that companies are being more transparent. <clears throat> it's really about standards that measures the business impact on society. Um, and it's a key in metric that investors are using. Your ESG score is absolutely tantamount. If you're on the stock exchange, you better have a good ESG score. Um, and companies, as soon as they hit the stock exchange, the first thing they do, start worrying about their ESG score. And all of a sudden, programs start implementing very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> the one thing I'll just highlight is that companies that have a good ESG score generally have a better stock performance than companies that don't have a good ESG score. Harvard uh, and many other organizations have looked at over trends over time and basically companies with the better ESG score will deliver a higher return on your investment if you invest in those companies. And so that's why investors want a good ESG score. Um, today we're tracking tens of thousands of data points. This just gives you an example of a chart of, whoops, can't touch the screen. Um, this just gives you a, a, a snapshot, a summary of energy use for facilities by month uh, across the globe. So there's a massive amount of data tracking. All this information goes into various types of reporting, CDP, Rubika SAM, Dow Jones and Sustainability Index, lots of data entry uh, and analysis. So today we have a pretty comprehensive sustainability program with lots of people involved and a lot of reporting. Um, we continue with all the different types of reports, carbon neutrality investments, programs. We track over 30 KPIs for every facility worldwide. A lot of information. When uh, in the 2000s we had basically each site had an environmental health and safety person or team and that was the, the extent of the effort being done. In the 2010s, we had more corporate. That's where I got involved at the corporate level, building a corporate team to start supporting the site teams. Today, we have a lot of people involved, lots of groups in the sustainability program. And it's not enough. Still, people are, are jumping, you know, it's like, we need more, we need more. Um, there's just so much going on. So when developing a sustainability program, I mentioned about the materiality analysis. That's one of the first things companies will do is determine what's relevant and important to them. If you're a, hu if you're a huge energy user, then energy is going to be important. If you're a company that uses a lot of water in your processing, then water is going to be important. So you want to put your time and effort to those things that are critical. The other thing you have to do is when you decide on putting a sustainability report together, you have to base it on some accepted standard in the world. These are just examples of the standards that uh, people will refer to when pulling their sustainability report together and program. These are the three um, covers to our three uh, sustainability reports for 2020, 2021, 2022, and we're in the process of preparing our 2023 sustainability report should be coming out relatively soon. These are on the web. Anybody can go and look at them and read them. Um, they're long, they're detailed. I wrote a lot of the data that goes in there. <laughs> it came from me and our team. Um, and every year we get audited and every one of our data points gets reviewed and analyzed and they go, okay, well you missed this one number. You wrote 625 and the invoice says 624. And so we get audited to make sure that our data is as accurate as humanly possible. So focus and approach, this is trying to simplify this as much as possible. Um, 
The four things that are big for us from an environmental perspective are energy and emissions. How can we reduce and eliminate uh, environmental compliance? We want to continue to be compliant with all the laws and regulations, but also improve, reduce the amount of waste, improve our recycling, um, waste management, and water stewardship. We don't use a lot of water. Most of the water is sinks and toilets. Um, so it's hard to get away from how do you reduce water. Um, we can't prevent people from using water, but it's still important. Um, the customers, the investors are still big on water, so we have to do something with water. And so we're looking for ways to improve our, our water management systems with recycling, gray water reuse, et cetera. Um, we've established a goal to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. That is that we will produce, if we produce greenhouse gases, we've got to offset every single ounce of greenhouse gases. If you read the papers in any given day, temperatures around the world are going up. People are getting more nervous. 2050 may not be soon enough. And so we've gone to saying we're going to get to 45% reduction by 2030 now. And, and who knows, in a few years, we may have to bring 2050 to 2035 for all we know the way things are going. That's a big challenge. Um, and we're trying to do, on a year-to-year -year basis right now, a 5% reduction in total energy use. Um, five, six years ago, we couldn't get money to put up any solar panels. Now, money is flowing. We are doing so many things worldwide. We're putting up solar plants all over the globe where we can, where everybody's got LED lights now. And you can't believe just putting in LED lights in a factory reduces total energy use by 2% to 10%, depending on the location. Just something that simple. Um, you walk into some places, it's pitch black. You start walking down a corridor, a light turns on, and as you walk, the lights go off behind you. Everything we can do to reduce energy. Um, so that's LED, center controls. Um, we're even looking at HVAC systems where if a person's not in a room, we're not going to heat it, we're not going to cool it until the person goes in the room conference room, hallway, et cetera. Water cooling systems. Um, we're converting a lot of the um, HVAC systems to water cool systems because they are 40 to 80% le more efficient, use less electricity. Um, use water, but use a lot less electricity. Um, electric charging stations, we can't put them in fast enough because people are buying electric cars. We're doing that everywhere. Uh, a lot of waste reduction and recycling efforts because that does reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, like I said, we're putting in wind and solar um, units all over the globe, our facilities. Here in Attleboro, we have purchased and guaranteed 100% renewable energy. Every single kilowatt hour that we burn is from a renewable energy source. Absolutely guaranteed. We've purchased it. It's expensive, but it was worth getting it. So. All the energy we use here is producing no greenhouse gases. Um, and so that's a guarantee going forward. Uh, but we're still looking at some additional measures to try to further reduce our energy and see what else we can do. Um, some of our facilities, well, our facility in Northern Ireland now has 100% renewable energy. They're getting it all from solar. And actually, no, sorry, wind, wind farms on the Baltic Sea. They've purchased all wind. Um, other facilities are getting it from steam. You know, a lot of places in Europe will use steam power um, and they're buying steam. So we are doing everything we can come up with. And these are just some of the things that we're doing and we're still coming up with more ideas. A lot of little ideas that we've implemented at different locations. So that's a summary of our game plan and the kinds of things we're doing. And well, again, I wanna thank Victoria, Mike for letting me uh, be here.